Hello, welcome to Bite Size Med. This video is on the thoracic cage. The thoracic cage is this butterfly looking set of bones, joints, ligaments, and muscles which form an actual cage in the chest around some pretty crucial organs, like the heart and the lungs. So it's this very protective structure. And we're going to be looking at the bony part of it, some stuff about the bones, joints, and ligaments. That would include the most obvious bones, the ribs, which form the rib cage, the vertebral column, the thoracic part of that, and up front and center, we have the sternum. 12 pairs of ribs, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and one sternum. We're going to start with the ribs. There are 12 pairs of ribs, which are flat bones that form most of the cage. There are three kinds of ribs, true, false, and floating ribs. At the anterior end of each rib is a piece of cartilage called the costal cartilage. If the rib attaches directly to the sternum via this cartilage, it is a true rib, or a vertebrosternal rib, because it goes from the vertebrae to the sternum. That's the first seven ribs, true ribs. False ribs attach to the cartilage of the rib above them, indirectly attaching to the sternum. They go from the vertebrae to cartilage, they are vertebrochondral ribs. That's 8, 9, and usually 10. 11 and 12 are floating ribs. They are free. They don't attach to the sternum, either directly or indirectly. They attach to the vertebrae, but not to the sternum. How do you remember this? Here's what I do. 7 looks like a T, that's 7 true ribs. F looks like a 3, the next 3 are false, and it's easy to remember that the last 2 are floating. They float together. Of these ribs, most of them are typical, some of them are atypical. If we take away the first two and the last three, that's ribs 1, 2, 10, 11, and 12, 3 to 9 are called typical ribs because they look similar. Let's assume this is a typical rib. This is the posterior end and this is the anterior end. We're looking at it from behind, a posterior view. The anterior end attaches to the costal cartilage. The body of the rib curves anteriorly, and that angle is called the costal angle. At the posterior end is the head of the rib, and there's a tubercle. Between the head and the tubercle is the neck of the rib. So head, neck, tubercle, and body of a rib. The head is going to attach to vertebrae. For that, it has two facets, the superior and inferior articular facets. In between the two is a crest. Let's take a little detour and look at the vertebra for a bit. There are 12 thoracic vertebrae, or the 12 pairs of ribs. Most of them are typical, meaning they have those typical vertebral features. Let's assume this is a typical thoracic vertebra, and we're looking at it from above. This is anterior, and this is posterior. They have a vertebral body, the vertebral arch, and the two are connected by pedicles, which extend backwards as a laminae. At the junction of the laminae, extending posteriorly, is the spinous process. In thoracic vertebrae, that spinous process is long and angled posteroinferiorly. There are transverse processes extending laterally. And the superior and inferior articular processes for the vertebrae to articulate with each other one below the other. But what's unique about thoracic vertebrae? They have facets to articulate with ribs. The body and the transverse processes articulate with ribs. The body has two facets. They are demi facets, one on the superior border and one on the inferior. These are for the heads of the ribs. Now we bring back the rib. So remember it's got two facets on the head. The inferior articular facet of the head of the rib articulates with its corresponding vertebra. For example, fifth rib with T5. The superior one articulates with the vertebra above. So fifth rib, T4. So one rib attaches to two vertebrae. But I also mentioned the transverse processes articulating with the rib. T for T. It articulates with the tubercle of the rib. Let's change the orientation and look at the attachments of the rib from above. This is anterior with the sternum, and this is posterior with the vertebra. 
the head of the rib articulates with the vertebral body, and the tubercle with the transverse process. What part of the tubercle? It has a smooth articular part and a non-articular part. The articular part of the tubercle articulates with the costal facet on the transverse process. That's how the ribs articulate with the vertebrae, but not all of them do this. That's where atypical comes in. There are atypical ribs and atypical vertebrae. The atypical ribs are like the first one. Why is it atypical? It's broader and shorter. The head of rib one just has one facet to articulate with a single complete facet on the first thoracic vertebra. So the first thoracic vertebra is also atypical. It has two grooves on its superior surface for the subclavian vessels. And in between the grooves is a scalene tubercle, which gives attachment to the anterior scalene muscle. Ribs 10, 11, and 12 also just have one facet on their heads to attach to one vertebra each. The 11th and 12th also don't have the tubercle, so there's no articulation with the transverse processes of the 11th and 12th vertebrae. Just the heads of these ribs articulate with the bodies of the vertebrae. These articulations form joints, costovertebral joints. The joints at the heads of the ribs are plain synovial joints. Between the articular facets, there was a crest on the head of the rib. Between the vertebral bodies is the intervertebral disc. The crest attaches to the disc by an intra-articular ligament of the head of the rib, which divides this joint into two spaces. Around this joint is a joint capsule, which anteriorly forms the radiate ligament of the head of the rib. Between the tubercle and the transverse process is the costo-transverse joint. It is supported by costo-transverse ligaments. They extend between the rib and the transverse processes. The costo-transverse ligament extends between the neck of the rib and the transverse process. There's also a lateral costotransverse ligament, which goes from the tubercle of the rib, the non-articular part, to the tip of the transverse process. A superior costotransverse ligament goes from the neck of the rib to the transverse process of the vertebra above it. All of this stuff was happening in the posterior aspect, but that rib curves anteriorly, and there it articulates with the costal cartilage, forming costochondral joints, which are primary cartilaginous joints. These are hyaline cartilage. They don't normally allow movement. The lower ribs form interchondral joints. These are joints between cartilage, interchondral, like between six and seven, seven and eight, and the eighth and ninth ribs. The costal cartilage articulates with the sternum. These are sternocostal joints between the sternum and costal cartilage. And now we've reached the sternum, a flat bone with three parts. The manubrium, the body, and the xiphoid process. The manubrium is this trapezoidal bone with a notch on the superior surface. This is called the suprasternal notch or the jugular notch. It's above the sternum. These two notches on the sides are for the clavicle. They are called the clavicular notches. The joints formed there would be between the sternum and the clavicle. They are the sternoclavicular joints, which we usually study with the clavicle. The manubrium attaches to the body by a manubrio-sternal joint. This forms an angle because the two bones are not in the same plane. That's called the sternal angle of Lewis, which is palpable and forms a landmark for a lot of things in anatomy. And if you have studied about it, now would be a good time to see how many you can remember. The body of the sternum provides attachment for most of the true ribs, except the first one. The first rib attaches to the manubrium by a fibrocartilage forming a synchondrosis. It doesn't move. The rest form plain synovial joints. There's a demifacet for the second rib on the manubrium. The body of the sternum is initially separate bones called sternobrae, separated by cartilage, but they fuse over time and form a single bone with ridges to mark where cartilage once was. The body is attached to the xiphoid process by a xiphy sternal joint. 
the xiphoid process is small and variable. It too undergoes ossification over time and is palpable as a landmark for the median plane. The manubrial sternal joint is a secondary cartilaginous joint, or a symphysis. The xiphy sternal joint is a primary cartilaginous joint, or a synchondrosis. Usually, midline joints are symphyses, but this one is a synchondrosis. So if we put it together, 12 vertebrae, 12 pairs of ribs, 7 true, 3 false, and 2 floating, 1 sternum with 3 parts, the manubrium, body, and xiphoid process. From behind, we have the intervertebral joints between the thoracic vertebrae, the costovertebral joints, the costotransverse joints, the costochondral joints, the interchondral joints, the sternocostal joints, the manubrial sternal, the xiphy sternal, and the sternoclavicular joints. Together, this cage moves during respiration to increase the dimensions of the thorax along with the muscles of respiration. In between the ribs are spaces called intercostal spaces. There are 12 pairs of ribs with 11 intercostal spaces between them. Each intercostal space has intercostal muscles, nerves, and blood vessels, and they're numbered according to the rib that forms the superior border of the space. So beneath the fifth rib is the fifth intercostal space. The thoracic dimensions increase vertically, anteroposteriorly, and to some extent transversely. The vertical dimension increases because of movement of the diaphragm. But the movement of the upper ribs moves the sternum like a pump handle, increasing the anteroposterior dimensions of the thorax. The lower ribs can move up and down like a bucket handle, increasing the transverse dimensions of the thorax. Those are the pump handle and bucket handle movements of the ribs. And that's briefly about the bones, joints, and ligaments that form the thoracic cage. I hope this video was helpful. If it was, you can give it a like and subscribe to my channel. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.